Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks so I can talk about the mental health and personality characteristics in the Susan Smith case. Another question related to this would be, are there cluster B personality features evident here? And did she receive a fair sentence? So, of course, Susan Smith and all the people that I'm talking about in this video are real people. So just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody here, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. So first I'll take a look at the timeline, then look at Susan Smith's background, and then take a look at the mental health and personality factors. So the timeline starts on October 25, 1994. We see 23-year-old Susan Smith of Union, South Carolina, reports to the police that a black gunman carjacked her vehicle containing her two young sons, Michael, who is three years old, and Alexander, who was 14 months old. She claimed the gunman had her drive around a bit, and then he told her to stop the car and get out of it. He told her he wouldn't hurt the kids before he drove off with them in the vehicle. She ran to a nearby house, knocked on the door, and told the owners about this alleged attack. In the days following, we see that she goes on many TV programs. She makes multiple pleas for her children to be returned to her safely. But this whole time along, the police actually suspect that Susan Smith is the perpetrator. This is because there were several problems with their story. For example, the description of the alleged attacker was quite vague. And Smith had claimed that she stopped at a red light at an intersection when she was carjacked. She said no one else was at that intersection. Now this particular intersection would have stayed green in her direction unless another car pulled up to the intersecting road. I don't really see this as a smoking gun as far as what the police found here because the other car could have passed through the intersection and she might not have seen it. It's not like her light would have turned green the instant the other car was through the intersection. But either way, this was enough to start putting pressure on Smith to confess. Now moving to November 3, 1994, we see that Susan Smith admits that she murdered her sons. She drove her 1990 Mazda Protégé to a nearby lake. She parked on a boat ramp. She put the car in drive and released the parking brake. Her sons were still strapped inside the vehicle. It came to rest about 122 feet from the shore, and of course, it was at the bottom of the lake. She told police that the children were alive when she released the parking brake so they drowned as a result of her actions. The police took credit for breaking the case wide open. Now, it was good they collected her confession, but I always find it funny how, in these high-profile cases, the detectives act like they're really the next Sherlock Holmes, because they did something basic, or what any detective would have done in that situation. It is fairly obvious that she was the perpetrator. This case did draw a lot of attention, and when that happens, it seems like law enforcement and other related fields want to get into that action. They want to be a part of all the excitement. Now, Susan was convicted and sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years. So, 30 years to life. She will be eligible for parole in 2024. Now, moving to her background, we see that Smith was born in 1971 in Union, South Carolina. Her name then was Susan Vaughn, but I'll just refer to her as Smith to keep the narrative straightforward. She was the youngest of three children and the only daughter of Linda and Harry Vaughn. When Smith was seven years old, her parents divorced, and five weeks after that, her father, Harry Vaughn, ended his own life. It was reported that Smith appeared sad and empty because of this, and she maintained a lot of distance from other people. So it was like she went off into her own world for a time. Now, a few weeks after the divorce, Linda married a man named Beverly Russell and moved the family to his house. At age 13, we see that Smith attempts to end her life. At age 16, we see that Russell starts abusing her. So we see she is a victim of sexual trauma. She reported this to social services, and Russell moved out temporarily. Soon after that, the family went to counseling sessions, and Russell moved back in. Smith later sought help from a school counselor. The Department of Social Services was once again contacted. However, Smith refused to press charges. I find it odd that Smith would have been required to press charges for social services to intervene because she was under 18. So I'm not exactly sure what happened there. But either way, social services stopped investigating and nothing happened to Russell. Now, Smith worked at a local grocery store during her senior year of high school. 
She was not only sexually active with Russell during that time, but also with an older married co-worker and a younger co-worker. After a breakup with a married man, we see that she attempted to end her own life by taking Tylenol and aspirin. So here we see her second attempt at suicide. Now, as all this was happening during Smith's teenage years, reports indicate that Smith was outgoing, well-liked, and volunteered in her community. In high school, she received the Friendliest Female Award. Seems like kind of a strange award, but I guess it's what they had available. So for many people, at least, Smith did not seem upset, depressed, or sad. She didn't really seem like she was under a lot of stress. And this was brought up at the trial, how somebody could be depressed and under stress, and other people would not necessarily notice. Now, at the same grocery store I talked about before, we see Smith starts another relationship with a coworker. His name was David Smith. He was already engaged to another woman, but he ended that engagement to be with Smith. Smith became pregnant, and David and her were married in 1991. The couple had difficulty right from the beginning, and they were separated by 1992. During that separation, Smith dated a former boyfriend. In November 1992, Smith became pregnant again, and her and David reconciled. The couple borrowed money from Susan Smith's mother to buy a house. They thought that having their own house would solve their problems. I've seen this strategy several times. It's typically not successful. In June 1993, David Smith had an affair with a coworker, and he claimed he did it because he was lonely and Susan Smith was distant. David and Susan's second child was born in August of 93, and the couple again reconciled. Within three weeks, David moved out. So we see a lot of relationship instability, a lot of attraction and avoidance, right? Getting together and breaking apart. Now, Smith left the grocery store and took a job with another company as a bookkeeper. She was soon promoted to the position of executive secretary for the president of that company, and she started dating his son in January of 1994. His name was Tom Finley. By the spring of 1994, Susan and David were back together, but this reconciliation, like so many before, did not last. A few more months later, Susan asked for a divorce. By September, she was back with Tom Finley. In October, Finley sent a letter to Smith saying he wanted to end the relationship. Now, I read this letter to prepare for this video. We see in it that Finley appeared to have a very high opinion of himself. The letter hinted that he was really too good for Smith. It didn't say it directly, but again, when you look between the lines, it was really there, in my opinion. He was direct, however, in stating that he did not want children, and he specifically didn't want to raise Smith's children. He referred to her as boy crazy. He was clearly shaken as well by seeing Smith kiss another man at a party that they were attending. What I found interesting was, outside of some grammar problems for which he apologized, the letter was actually expressive and quite detailed. He put a lot of energy into it. This letter was found inside of the car at the lake, right? So it was in the same car that Smith's sons were in. Now, complicating all this was the fact that Smith was still in a relationship with Russell and claimed to be in a relationship with Tom Finley's father. On the day of the murders, she made another attempt to repair her relationship with Finley, but she was not successful. Many have connected this breakup to the murders, suggesting really that her reaction to this breakup is what led her to be homicidal. Smith has denied this. So that's the background leading up to the crime. There's also information on how Smith has fared in prison, and this could give some indication about mental health and personality factors. Smith was disciplined for substance use, this is in prison, in 2010 and 2015. She was also disciplined for self-harm. In 2000, when Smith was 28, she was disciplined for having sex four times with a 50-year-old guard. He ended up doing three months in prison for that. Not long after, she did the same thing with another guard. This guard was a captain. He was sentenced to five months probation. The guard's name was Alfred Rowe. He's been interviewed a few times about this incident, and he really tries to make it seem like he was the victim. He says that there was only one incident, and he was seduced. Smith says that there were multiple incidents and she was seduced. He claimed that Smith started seeking him out. She would wait until his shift started to bring up various concerns. It sounds like she was really talking to him a lot. She said that she was lonely, and he looked lonely too. 
Now, Roe really makes it seem like this happened because of Smith's incredible powers of manipulation, like he was helpless to do anything about it. Interestingly, as ridiculous as this is, it seems as though other prison officials may think the same way. They view Susan Smith as manipulative and clever, like she has this incredible power over men and she cannot be left alone with a male guard. When she is transported, they send one male and one female prison guard, and they try to transport her with other prisoners, right? So they're clearly afraid of her. I don't know if it's rational or not to be afraid of her, but they clearly have a fear about her powers of manipulation. I think the bottom line with this is those prison officials need to take responsibility for their behavior. Susan Smith does not have magical powers, and it's illegal for them to have any type of intimate contact with her. She's a prisoner there, and they are in a position of power. There's really no excuse for that behavior, regardless of what crimes she committed, and regardless of whether those crimes involved seduction or manipulation. I can only characterize their lack of ownership as disturbing. Now, while in prison, Smith has defended herself. We see different media outlets have reported having communication with her. She reports feeling remorse. She says she's not the monster that society believes that she is. Others in the prison have described her as a tortured soul. Smith said that she told the lies about the carjacking to protect the families and not herself. So that doesn't really sound like she's taking responsibility. Smith has indicated that she did not kill her sons because of the relationship ending with Finley, but rather she went to the boat ramp intending to end her own life. When she got there, however, something happened and she ended up committing the murders. It's really not clear why she did it. There are reports that she writes back and forth with multiple love interests and that she has a love interest in prison. We also see that she appealed her conviction in 2010. It was handwritten, it was really not well thought out, and of course it was unsuccessful. Now moving to the mental health and personality characteristics that we may see in a case like this. As I mentioned before, I can't diagnose. I can only look at the behaviors and align them with different mental health and personality constructs. There are many popular theories about this case. We see theories that suggest that Smith has antisocial personality disorder or perhaps simply psychopathic features. Those two are kind of related. We see theories about her being narcissistic. This was actually used by the prosecution when arguing for the death penalty. We see theories about borderline and histrionic features as well. And of course, we see theories about dependent personality disorder and major depressive disorder. She was actually diagnosed with these two disorders by one of the defense experts. And these diagnoses were used by the defense to argue for life in prison as opposed to the death penalty. Substance use was also brought up in her defense. So I'll start my analysis by looking at dependent personality disorder, DPD, major depressive disorder, MDD, and the substance use part. Then I'll move to the other traits because they're all from cluster B personality pathology. This is a group of four personality disorders we see in the DSM, namely antisocial, narcissistic, borderline, and histrionic. Now in this trial, we see this unusual disorder brought up by the defense, again, DPD. This is a disorder that involves a lot of factors around support and the fear of losing support. Now, in looking at the DSM, we see that DPD is characterized by having difficulty making decisions without others helping out, needing others to assume responsibility for most areas of life, having difficulty expressing disagreement, having difficulty initiating projects, going to excessive lengths to obtain support, feeling uncomfortable or helpless when alone, urgently seeking another relationship after one has ended, and being unrealistically preoccupied with fears of being left to take care of oneself. So the defense tried to use this to mitigate Smith's culpability. The problem here is that this disorder is not really associated with violence. It doesn't really explain her behavior well at all. Major depressive disorder, especially when combined with alcohol, would have a better chance of explaining this type of crime, and there is evidence that aligns the symptoms with what was going on here in this case, but it still doesn't really explain why this happened. Substance use is fairly straightforward. Susan Smith used alcohol, but it's not clear how that may have contributed to the crimes. It seems reasonable to think that it didn't help, though, right? Alcohol usually makes everything worse. Now moving over to the cluster B personality features that may have been at work in a case like this. We see that personality features are considered long-term. So simply expressing a behavior 
once or twice is not enough to align with the symptoms of these personality disorders. So I'll start by looking at antisocial. So when looking at these symptom criteria for antisocial personality disorder, we don't really see much of an alignment here with Smith. One could make an argument for impulsivity and poor planning, and of course, a lack of remorse. But in terms of the other ones, we don't really see a strong case. Repeated unlawful behaviors, she had the one unlawful behavior, and then lying about it afterward. Consistent deceitfulness, again, she lied after the murders, but I don't necessarily see a trend here. Aggression, it seems limited to the murders. A reckless disregard for safety, that again seems limited, and consistent irresponsibility. A case could be made for this one, but it's not really clear. So we see that with this disorder, there's not really a good alignment. So it's difficult to make a case for antisocial. What about psychopathy? Again, this is a related construct. Well, there's quite a bit of overlap, so we don't really see too much in terms of psychopathy either. Psychopathy does have some characteristics that we don't see with antisocial, like promiscuity, and that could be happening here, of course. But other than that, we don't really see a lot of alignment with the construct of psychopathy. Next, moving to narcissism. This was brought up, as I mentioned, by the prosecution when they were looking for the death penalty for Smith. They weren't successful, but of course they still made this part of the process. They looked at narcissistic characteristics. They indicated that Smith really felt like she was the center of her own universe. She was obsessed by how she looked on television. She showed no remorse. They used this evidence that she initially said that she regretted telling Tom how she was having an affair with his father, but she had no regret about the murders. They indicated she was selfish. She killed others to get what she would want, so that one seems pretty clear, and manipulative, pleading for her children's return on television when she knew that she had murdered them. I think an argument can be made here for narcissism, but the alignment with the official mental disorder associated with narcissism, narcissistic personality disorder, is really not quite clear. A case can be made for requiring admiration, lacking empathy, being manipulative, but that's not really strong enough for NPD. Now looking at the alignment with borderline personality disorder, BPD, here one can make a much stronger argument. Many people were quite surprised that this wasn't really featured as part of the defense strategy. BPD has nine symptom criteria. Frantic efforts to avoid abandonment. We see some evidence supporting this. An unstable relationship pattern. We see that relationship with David Smith and several others that were on again, off again. Identity disturbance. This one's not clear, right? This particular symptom criterion, we don't really have any direct evidence for this one. The next one is impulsivity in at least two areas that are potentially self-damaging. There's some evidence for this. Suicidal behavior, this one's fairly clear. Affective instability, I think one could make an argument for that. Chronic feelings of emptiness, similarly, I think a good argument could be made for that one. Inappropriate or intense anger or difficulty controlling anger, this isn't really clear from before the murders, but certainly there could have been some anger during the murders. Again, we just don't know enough about what she was thinking at that time. So this one is hard to be certain about. And the last one is paranoid ideation or severe dissociation. This one's not quite clear, but there was some reference at trial to the idea of dissociation. So in talking about borderline features, again, we see a much better alignment here than we did with narcissistic or antisocial personality disorders. One can make the argument that what we have here is really vulnerable narcissism, which of course has a relationship to borderline personality. With vulnerable narcissism, we see characteristics like hypersensitivity to criticism and having a lot of distrust, and other characteristics that really overlap strongly with borderline, like insecurity. Right. So again, those two constructs are related. So this brings me to the last personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, HPD. Now, here we see that some of the symptoms have alignment and a number don't. But this isn't really that surprising because it's not unusual that if somebody has cluster B personality pathology, they have a few symptoms from many of the personality disorders in that cluster. So with HPD, we see wanting to be the center of attention and inappropriate provocative behavior. We see evidence for both of these but really a lack of evidence for the rest of the symptoms. Rapidly shifting emotions, using physical appearance to draw attention, although 
Maybe some case could be made for that. Impressionistic speech, being dramatic and theatrical, and being suggestible, right? So a lot of those, you could look at this situation and say, well, they could apply, but we don't really necessarily have concrete evidence that could align them. So there's a look at the mental health and personality characteristics. So what happened in this case? Well, there's no way to be sure, but one theory that would make sense here is that the trauma led to a number of cluster B personality features, mostly borderline and histrionic with some antisocial and narcissistic features. And this really became an unfortunate profile for the circumstances, right? So we see a lot of short-term relationships, a lot of arguing, a lot of strife, and an individual who couldn't really process or handle those stimuli in a pro-social way, right? So it explains how that stress could be converted into something like violent behavior and explains why we saw so much callousness, like a lack of empathy, after the murders, right? So it's not just the difficulty of the stress and the violence, it's how one acts after that, right? All those behaviors are somewhat consistent with cluster B personality features. Now, it's worth noting that even with this type of personality profile, these murders were unusual. It's not the expected behavior for this particular profile. So this type of behavior is really difficult to predict. Mothers don't kill their children very often. There aren't a lot of cases to look at, and we don't have the ability to gather a lot of data about it and draw really firm conclusions, like put together a model that says, if we see these behaviors, we know this other behavior is going to occur. So again, difficult to predict because of how unusual it is. Of course, it's good that it is unusual because it's such a terrible crime. It was clearly devastating that Michael and Alexander died, and it was also devastating for the families. So we see terrible consequences here from Smith's behavior. So with that in mind, do I think the sentence was fair? I'm actually satisfied with the sentence, 30 years to life. I'd be surprised if she ever gets out of prison, so it's probably really just life in prison. She has been far from a model prisoner, and I'm confident that'll be a factor in her first parole hearing. I think it's somewhat likely that later in life, if she lives until 70 or 75, she could be released at that point. I don't see them really releasing her in her 50s. However, I don't know for sure. We already saw some unusual behavior in that prison system with all those relationships occurring, so it's possible that they could let her out in parole. If she's released in her 50s, I don't think that would really be reasonable. I can understand the difficulty with this case, though. The crimes, again, were horrible, but the victim had been through a lot of things, too. All the trauma, really just a horrible amount of traumatic experiences. It's really difficult to imagine how Smith would have come out and not done something that deviated from society's norms. Of course, again, we wouldn't expect somebody to murder in those circumstances, but it wouldn't have been really unusual for some type of criminal activity that drew the attention, again, of society. So really tough case, just a great example of how trauma can lead to more trauma. We see that the damage of trauma is not really just contained to the victim. It can also affect the victim and they can turn into a perpetrator. So the effects of trauma can ripple throughout time and through many people. Now those traumatic experiences, again, can't be directly tied to the violence. Like not everybody who experiences that will commit that level of violence. But I think it certainly was a contributing factor. It makes sense. It's reasonable to think that that played a part. And really, again, we see a series of things that happen that led to the murders. So the trauma, the unstable relationships, the poor coping styles, and this just moves forward until eventually we see these horrible crimes. Now, I know whenever I talk about cases like this, there will be a variety of opinions. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.